Greetings, everyone. I'm Michael Nagler of the Na Meta Center for Nonviolence, and this is your first independent podcast of nonviolence in the news. It is not only independent from corporate media and corporate sponsorship, but this time we are going independent of our mother program, Peace Paradigm Radio. Partly because yesterday's show, it, today is September 17th, 2016, Yesterday's show was uh, an extraordinary interview with uh, Chief Phil Lane Jr., who had recently returned from Standing Rock. And I would ex uh, heartily recommend that you listen to that show in its entirety on kwmr.org or here on the Meta Center website as soon as we have put it up. But uh, we are now going to do independent podcasts of nonviolence in the news probably also on a bi-weekly basis. So, as usual, we'll start by mentioning a couple of resources. The International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, ICNC, has partnered with Rutgers University, their International Institute for Peace, and they're going to be putting on a course called, an online course called People Power, the Study of Strategic Nonviolent Resistance. The course itself will be October 6th to November 17th of this year, 2016. But the application deadline is coming up quickly, September 25th. As I mentioned, the last episode of Peace Paradigm Radio, a number of books are coming out about nonviolence. Uh, Brian Martin reviews some of them in uh, on the Waging Nonviolence website. And I'd also like to mention one by Sarah Jaffe called Necessary Trouble and a Long Hard Struggle. That looks to be a very good study of the situation that we're in right now with non domestic nonviolent resistance. And uh, in contrast to our usual style, I'm going to quote something from the author of a song and book called The Necessity of Violence. It's uh, not very pleasant to hear, but I want us to be absolutely uh, aware of the danger of mass media, commercial mass media, and in particular, the video games that we're showing to our children. Uh, these games, he's talking about a certain set of games, are about killing zombies and pondering to my bloodlust. They often have a very graphic depiction of violence, switching out humans for aliens or blood for oil, making violence a bit more consumable, easier to swallow. And he concludes, my favorite games have been the ones that ridicule the idea that I have any control over my own instincts, that I can act rationally in high tension situations. So I'm doing this to illustrate two things. The, if you have any influence over younger people, that they should be aware of how dangerous and dehumanizing video games are, 99% of them in the market, but also the close, close connection between adherents of the old story and believers in violence. He says that he wants to ridicule the idea that he has any control over my own instincts. Well, science doesn't even really believe in instincts anymore. And a key element of the new science being discovered by scientists and rediscovered in the wisdom tradition is that we are in complete control of what we become and what we do. Neither genes nor hormones nor any kind of mindless influence can make us do, believe, or be something that we don't want to be. Okay, well, I'm sorry about that uh, bit of negativity. On to the news, and starting, of course, with here in the U.S. Uh, Marjorie Cohn, uh, in Consortium News, has discussed California Proposition 62, the Justice That Works Act. It is on the November 8 ballot in California, and if the initiative passes, it will replace the death penalty with life in prison without parole. Not only that, it will also require people convicted of murder to work and pay restitution to their victims' families. 
So this could be a major element in a, in a big shift toward restorative justice. And another area in Detroit, uh, as happened in the first Intifada in Palestine, the failure of public schools, in this case what they call emergency managed schools because of the bankruptcy of the city, the failure of those schools, uh, parents have taken the educational system into their own hand and created freedom schools that offer an alternative to the city's struggling education system. That was reported in Yes Magazine. Now, also in Yes Magazine, a very interesting article, A New Economic Vision, that mixes together Occupy, Amish culture, and startups. Here at the Meta Center, we've been very concerned with the new economy going along with the new story, and in fact, our next animation in our new story animation series will, about, will be about the new economy. And of course, I still want to say a little bit more about Standing Rock. Um, if, according to our guest of yesterday's Peace Paradigm Radio, this is a spiritual renewal, and it is a bringing together of indigenous voices in a way that has never happened before. You have uh, indigenous people coming from Ecuador, coming from New Zealand, Maori people coming to the no DAPL protests in, in North Dakota. DAPL is Dakota Access Pipeline. And uh, I, I quoted, and I'd like to share again with you a little bit of a statement by David Archambault, who was the head of the Dakota, uh, Standing Rock Dakota community. I want to say again the following. We are also a resilient people who have survived unspeakable hardships in the past so we know what is at stake now. As our songs and prayers echo across the prairie, we need the public to see that in standing up for our rights, we do so on behalf of the millions of Americans who will be affected by this pipeline. He goes on, as one of our greatest leaders, Chief Sitting Bull of the Hongpapa Lakota once said, let us put our minds together and see what life we can make for our children. That appeal is as relevant today as it was more than a century ago, unquote. I'm pleased to say that presidential candidate from the Green Party, Jill Stein, has participated in spray painting a bulldozer and uh, got herself arrested in the process. So that leads me to an analysis of what I've been able to see so far of the protesters, or as they have renamed themselves, the protectors, at Standing Rock. Uh, what is very, very effective and very uh, worthwhile to be noted is that they are covering a spectrum of actions. They had to act quickly, of course, so there's no time to first do a regular constructive program and then move on to resistance. They had to do them simultaneously. So they're taking legal action. They're suing the Army Corps of Engineers for their decision to allow the pipeline to go through their sacred lands and under the Missouri River. They are petitioning. They have, Some of them actually walked to Washington, D.C. to present the petition to President Obama, who unfortunately did not receive them. There is a large component of prayer and ceremony, which uh, I think can be very effective on various levels, and we may perhaps sit down and discuss that with you sometime. There's a tremendous coalition building going on. As I mentioned, there are not only almost 300 U.S. tribes, but tr international indigenous people have come to join them. And then finally, they have put their bodies on the line. Uh, and it's in this connection that I want to mention that the spray painting of bulldozers, etc., it's a little bit of a gray area in nonviolence. Uh, property destruction... We never have really decided whether under what circumstances is that really a nonviolent thing to do, considering that it does an end run around the will of your opponent, and changing the opponent's will is actually what you're ideally aiming at, ideally aiming at in nonviolence. They are stating that they are not against the 5,000 workers 
who are putting in the pipeline. You may remember we interviewed Sherry Mitchell some time ago about a similar development in Maine. Uh, and she said that at a campfire one night when they were protesting, the fracking companies are coming in. A truck from the company stopped. The driver got out, walked over to their encampment. He was crying and he said, I don't want to do this, but I have nothing, uh, no other way to feed my family. On the other hand, uh, most of what I have heard in by way of explanation and the calls for nonviolence have been in the strategic area. In other words, they've said, let's not be violent because that's what they are waiting for. One little act of violence from them and they unleash the attack dogs, the fire hoses and everything. Now, I'm not uh, suggesting for a moment that that isn't true but it is only a kind of relatively weak strategic reason for nonviolence. A deeper reason would be, are you actually committed to this as, as part of your identity, as what you think we are as human beings and how we are to be related to one another? Is it in recognition of our unity or is it just a tactic? I posed this question in, in, a, in another form to Chief Fulane, and he says, absolutely, that other level of reasoning is there. It's embedded in indigenous culture. So please go and listen to uh, that interview on Standing Rock, which has now uh, hit the mainstream newspapers and is the biggest development in nonviolent protests in this country in many years. Certainly the next third wave after first Occupy and secondly, the Bernie revolution. Bernie Sanders' campaign. I want to mention uh, an ex illustration of military logic and of the power of story, what we believe to be true. I want to contrast two South American countries, Bolivia and Colombia. They both have been growing coca and have been part of the supply chain for the cocaine habit of uh, up here in the north. And the official report uh, by the United States agencies has called Bolivia demonstrably a failure. What the reality is that the amount of coca being grown in Bolivia has decreased every year for five years. They're now praising Colombia and restoring their, uh, re continuing their uh, uh, financial support. Whereas in Colombia, even in one last year, the amount of coca production went up 40%. So what's going on here? In Bolivia, Evo Morales, the indigenous-born president of the country, has been talking to coca growers and explaining to them that they can grow coca for ceremonial purposes, but not for cocaine, and making it financially possible for them. And this reminds me when we met with Senator Paul Wellstone in Berkeley some years ago, the late Senator Paul Wellstone. He said that he had just come back from Colombia and found that when they paid farmers not to grow coca, it cost 20 times less, one twentieth of what it cost to eradicate the crops after they're grown. Moving on now to little events elsewhere in the world in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there was a student protest that blocked a planned ethnic segregation of the schools. Uh, a quote from those kids. When we heard that they wanted to separate us, we decided to inform all the presidents of the classes and the student council to form a group of students who will fight against the, pro the problem. That's a 15-year-old Tarek Sage, who is one of the organizers for Nicola Sop Secondary School. He goes on, we decided to do a protest because we thought that was the best solution to prevent the separation and show everyone, especially the government and all other people who supported the separation, that we have our rights. And these students prevailed. He said, we are very happy and satisfied with the decision and we will continue with our activities in the future. I couldn't help but remembering that my brother went to Croatia uh, some years ago, uh, because he is a, a folk singer and was sent there by the Canadian government. 
And when he got to a high school there, he was told that they were going to have to do two concerts because there were Bosnian kids and Serb kids, and uh, they never, ever met. And my brother consulted with his band and came back and said, you know what, we're going to do one concert, and that's what you have to deal with. So they did one concert, and those kids were together for the very first time. So it is wonderful, and uh, there are other episodes where uh, school children refused to separate themselves into different ethnic groups. Uh, in this case, they would not have been uh, killed, but it, during the Bosnian uh, and Yugoslav wars, they actually uh, it meant consigning one group or the other to uh, probable execution. Moving on now, I'm happy to say that Search for Common Ground, an organization that we really, really like, has engaged four and a quarter million people around the world this past year. In particular, they have trained 32 journalists to report the facts and refute rumors. Rumors are one of the most potent ways of starting conflict. And I'll also mention that the women's boat to Gaza that we talked about in our last episode of Peace Paradigm Radio, those boats have set sail. There are two boats, the Amal, meaning hope, and Zaytuna, which means olive in Arabic. They have set out from Barcelona under very festive uh, occasion, a very joyful and wonderful send-off from the dock. However, the Amal shortly after developed engine trouble and had to turn back. So we will see what happens. It should take about three weeks to get to Gaza with the various stops that they're doing along the way. Moving on to events now, uh, the biggie, of course, starts tomorrow. And that is the third annual Campaign Nonviolence Week of Action, September 18th through 25th, 2016. And I'm very happy to report that they have now reached 650 nonviolent actions. They're being planned in all 50 U.S. states and in 16 other countries. The program of campaign nonviolence is as follows, taking nonviolent action, fostering a nonviolent culture, expanding nonviolence training. They have a program called 1000 Trainings, nurturing a movement of movements, which I have a little bit more to say about in a second, and spreading resources for peaceful change and building their own campaign, campaign nonviolence. Now, I said I wanted to say a little bit more about the movement of movements. In, uh, down the road in November, we're going to be having a meeting in Berkeley on November 12th, uh, which will partly be a celebration of the 30th anniversary of Tikkun and partly a movement of movement meetings between uh, the Meta Center for Nonviolence and uh, the Network of Spiritual Progressives. Of course, we'll be telling you more about that as we get closer to time. But speaking of closer to time, friends, if you're local and you're listening to this on time, do be aware that on September 23rd, which I have been told is a Friday, in the evening there will be a party with a purpose taking place at the Arlene Francis Center. Music by the Love Choir, original songs by Abraham Enton, and that will be a screening of the trailer for Meta's uh, nonviolent documentary, The Journey Home, and it will be largely uh, a benefit for the Meta Center with uh, food provided and wonderful music. So I hope if you have heard us on time, we will see you in Santa Rosa at the Arlene Francis Center. So thank you very much for listening, everyone. This has been our first independent broadcast or podcast of Nonviolence in the News. Please do write us and let us know how, how it worked for you, what you would like to hear, and so forth. You can write us at info at metacenter.org, and meta, of course, with two Ts. And if Stephanie Van Hook were here, she would be saying, until next time, take care of one another. Goodbye for now.